Howdy partners, my name is James, and today we're gonna to be talking about The Alloy of Law by Brandon Sanderson. This is the first book in Mistborn Era 2, and I have to say, going into this, I thought that this was going to be some kind of rootness tootness cowboy adventure, and I was pleasantly surprised that it was not that. I mean, just right off the bat, did I love it as much as The Final Empire? No, I don't think that anything is going to touch, at least anything Mistborn related is going to touch the final empire for me. But I didn't hate it and actually ended up having a really good time with it. The idea of Mistborn moving into a Western setting whenever I first heard it sounded really cringy, actually, and made me kind of nervous to read it. But with The Lost Metal coming out in November and with my recent obsession of loving to read series as they're being released, I just thought it would be fun because I knew that I wanted to read these eventually to complete my Cosmere reading. I was just really worried about this series because I'd heard a lot of people say that some of the dialogue is really cringy, that Sanderson tries too hard to be funny, and that it just doesn't pull off the magic of the first series. And I was just pleasantly surprised with this. I think the best way that I could describe the alloy of law is like, it felt like the pilot episode of, of a spinoff show, honestly. Like this, this book is one of the shortest books I've read this year. I think I, I read it in less than a week. Yeah, at 383 pages, it's not very long at all. It, it took me the better part of a week just because I wasn't really able to read as much as I wanted to this week, but I knew that starting this month, just up to November, I knew that I wanted to start fitting in one of these every month. And with how short they are, it, it was so easy to do. I was pleasantly surprised that this wasn't a spaghetti Western setting. I guess whenever I had first heard kind of what this series was about, I was assuming that it was going to be some kind of small town ruffian, you know, defends a, a helpless, you know, like the, what is that? What is that Western? The Magnificent Seven or... I thought it was going to be something more like that. Something a little bit more stereotypical of Westerns and it, it has its its nods to the Western genre, but it's not just a spaghetti Western novel. It had very, very similar themes to the original Mistborn, to the Final Empire. It felt like a similar nod, but just with a very different take. The main character, Wax, is kind of an outsider of upper society in a lot of the same ways that Vin was so you know whenever he's having to do upper society things like go to balls or interact with nobles or stuff like that he's constantly just feeling on the outside it helped kind of ground it in the Mistborn universe for me it helped me feel like that this was a continuation of a world so i i guess just kind of in in like overview of what this is about it follows your your main character his name is wax Wax Ladrian, I think is how you say his last name. And he is a lawkeeper on the world of Scadrial 300 years after the events of the original Mistborn trilogy. And so the, the world has progressed 300 years since the Hero of Ages. Technology has advanced, people have studied allomancy, and it have much more of a scientific understanding of how to use it. New metals and alloys have been discovered and created, and so with new alloys, with allomancy, comes new powers. This was one area that I thought that the world building was, I mean, kind of what Sanderson gets praised for a lot of times is his world building. And I feel like that Scadrial does progress in a way that feels natural. It does feel like 300 years of study and evolution and, and progress into Allomancy has, has happened and it, it feels deserved and it feels grounded. It feels grounded in the world and, and I like that a lot. So like I said, your, your protagonist, his name is Wax. He is a law keeper. He is also a twin born, which is something that is new to this series, which means he has both an Allomantic ability and a ferrochemical ability. So for those of you who are familiar with the Mistborn universe, that means that he can, he is a, which, which is the one that lets you push? Is it steel? Also, shout out to Brandon Sanderson for keeping like all of the metals and stuff and like what they do in the back because that makes it really easy to look this stuff up. So he can use iron ferrochemy and steel allomancy. <laughs> 
basically what that allows him to do is like Vin in the original trilogy makes him kind of like a coin shot so he can push himself through the air, he can push on metals, he can see where all of the metals are with like the blue lines that I still think is just one of the coolest like mental images is it's just seeing all of these lines going to all the metal around him and uh, push on them. And then there's all the physics associated with whether what you're pushing on weighs more than you. And that's where his iron ferrochemy comes into play is he can change his physical weight. He can change his mass. It allows for a very different dynamic of powers than what we saw with the original trilogy, because I, correct me if I'm wrong, and I could just be misremembering, but I don't remember that there were any like twinborns in the original trilogy. His partner, Wayne, is also a twinborn and he, Crap. I think it's gold and then bend alloy. Yeah, so he can use gold ferrochemy and bend alloy is one of the new alloys that has been discovered. So he can create these time bubbles around himself where he is actually in within this time bubble. Time is moving quicker for him than it is for everybody else. But to the people outside of this time bubble, he is actually just, it, it looks like he's moving really fast or that, um, He's messing with time. He has time powers. He does time stuff. And that's really interesting and cool. And so their abilities just combined, those two, are just really dynamic and interesting to read. I was curious to see going into this if there were just going to be more Mistborn, if that's who we were going to be following. I love how events of the first trilogy are kind of turned into religions and turned into belief systems. And if you have read the original trilogy and you know how that ends, I think that you'll really appreciate this little touch of world building because it, it's a very clear just nod and I wouldn't call it fan service -y or anything, but it's a clear appreciation of what he did in the last books. The plot of this book feels like an, an episode of Sherlock. Like it doesn't feel like as vast or as expansive as some of his other books it, it doesn't feel as epic this this might be one of the most grounded Cosmere stories that I've read so far it feels very self-contained very small but I actually think that that's what I really liked about it I think that part of the reason that it hit for me is I've been reading Sun Eater and I have been reading slowly very slowly like a chapter or two a week have been making my way through The Name of the Wind. And this is Sanderson's tried and true multi POV, third person, snappy dialogue. I mean, those kinds of things. And I think it was just like the break that I needed. I needed, I needed to read a less than 400 page book. I didn't have to like really, really engage my brain to keep up with it. And I think that that is a praise of this series. I think that some people who want a more complicated and deep plot would probably find this book lacking, especially if they're coming straight from Mistborn Era 1 into Era 2 and thinking that, that it's going to be comparable to that, when when really it's it's not. It's not a similar style of story at all. The plot is like an episode of Sherlock. It's a self-contained mystery, basically. There are these robberies by these criminals that nobody can figure out how they're committing these robberies, and Wax has inherited his uncle's estate, basically. Wax was living outside of this major city. The city's name is Ellendale. And he was living out in the roughs, which is like the more spaghetti western style place that I was afraid that things were going to take place in. But he ends up moving into the city to inherit the estate and kind of take charge of his family's business or whatever. And in doing so, along with a, a fairly tragic event that it literally happens in the prologue and I think that it should just be read because I, within within reading the prologue, I was like, okay, I might actually really enjoy this because it, it hits pretty hard within the first just few pages. So he moves into the city, kind of swears off law keeping and decides I'm gonna be an estate person. And then these crimes start happening and he can't turn the law keeper side of his brain off. He starts investigating, he starts trying to figure things out and then it all just kind of unfolds from there. And I think it really is just summarized best and it, it feels like an episode of, of TV. It feels very episodic. It feels very self-contained. It feels very small. I think I read somewhere at the end that the whole book takes place, well, the main events of the book, once the stakes really pick up, takes place over like a day and a half. Towards the beginning as things are kind of getting set up and time is moving a little quicker. But once the main inciting incident really starts, um, and you get the main, I mean, first real like battle of the book. 
Everything for the rest of the book is very fast paced, takes place within, yeah, like I said, I think like a day and a half. And so it is just a great, quick little read. I didn't go in thinking that it was gonna be era one and had a really good time with it. I didn't need to put those standards on it to, to enjoy it. I think for that reason, more people should read it. So just super, super quick. I just had a couple of spoilery things that I wanted to talk about and then I'll just kind of jump into my final thoughts on it and then the video will be over. These are spoilers. If you have not read the book or you don't want these things spoiled for you, just click ahead to the final thoughts part of the video, click later on or go watch something else. I'll throw something up there that you can go watch instead. But I'm just gonna talk about spoilers just for a second and then we'll wrap it up. So there were a few different parts of the book were just kind of, I think I heard somebody else describe it as campy, which I, I totally agree with. I do think that Sanderson was trying to write something a little bit more lighthearted than just the dark, gritty tone of Era One. And Wayne is kind of the source of the campiness in a lot of the parts of the book. On one hand, I really love Wayne. I love the comedic relief that he brings, and he is legitimately an interesting and compelling character, but he is also the character that in the next books I'm hoping gets a lot more development. Wax is the main character, in, at least in this book, and you spend the majority of the time with Wax. And so he gets most of the development, he gets most of the, the backstory. Really, the other POV characters like him and Marasi, Marasai, the girl, I, can't, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out how to pronounce her name, Marasai. They did not get quite the development that I think they could have. With this being such a short and contained story, I don't think that that's what Sanderson was trying to do. I think he was trying to tell a story about Wax and then just kind of split off here and there to tell little subplots through Marisai and Wayne. And I think that he has left enough there to be explored in future books. Overall, I would have liked to see just a little bit more. I mean, he kind of gave us a taste of Wayne's backstory whenever him and Marisai were kind of talking in the warehouse and about how, you know, Wax kind of brought him back from a life of being a criminal. And then Marisai, we, we kind of learned that she's an illegitimate daughter of Lord Harms, that whole estate. And so that kind of explains why she's in the city and not a cousin or some distant relative or something like that. And I, I will say that I do think that I, I like how the kind of love interest between Wax and Marisai ended. I don't, I don't even know if there's a name for the trope where there's like one love interest that you're supposed to not like and then there's another one that you really like and then the main character ends up going for the one that you really like in the end. I don't know if there's a name for that, but that's kind of what I was worried was gonna happen. And I, so I was actually pretty relieved with how it ended with, with it just kind of not divulging into that. It made Wax seem like the older, mature, conflicted and broken individual that he's supposed to be. I was trying to, there was one specific spot that I, did I write it down? There's one spot that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I'm thinking that I remembered the part that I was wanting to say. The spoilery thing that I thought was really stupid is in a world where everybody has like thought about metal and developed allomancy so much farther, why would they continue to use like nails to build things? Like the part where wax flies up into the air and like basically destroys an entire building by pushing all of the nails and all of the metal in the building to the ground. Like if powerful allomancers like him exist, why would you continue to build things out of metal? Anyway, that, that was it. That was a nitpick, but that it, I felt like it was worth bringing up. Back to the video. Most of the spoilery stuff that I was thinking of was really a lot to do with Miles. I think that Miles was a good villain in that episodic mindset, like with the mindset of this being just a self-contained short, like I, I think pilot episode is the best way to describe it. So like, Pilots are made before the rest of a season is produced. And so a pilot is made to sell you on the idea of something. And that's exactly what this felt like. It felt like being sold on, this is the new era of Mistborn. This is the direction we're going with things. And so we're gonna tell a, a brief, self-contained, exciting story to get you interested in the characters, up to date with the world. And then we'll kind of tease on a little bit of a bigger plot basically that's happening. And you see that with Wax's uncle being the, the Mr. Suit, which I kind of had wondered at the beginning 
if that's the direction that they were gonna go and then I just put it in the back burner and so whenever it was revealed at the end, that was like, it was actually satisfying for me to, you know, maybe some people would find it cliche, but I'm very simple. I mean, whenever some stuff like that happens, I'm just like, cool, I figured it out, you know? It makes me feel smart and I like that. I like feeling smart. So final thoughts on the Alloy of Law. Um, overall, I had a really great time with it. Um, there were a few parts of like forced humor that I just did not, I just kind of rolled my eyes at, you know, I would I would give one of the, <laughs> one of those laughs or like a, you know, like a nose laugh. You ever nose laugh? And then there were a few parts that genuinely made me laugh, you know, because I've seen some people say that they don't think that Sanderson is funny. I disagree with that. I don't think that he is always funny. I don't think that all of his jokes land. I do think that he can be funny when he wants to be. And, you know, like I said, with Wayne kind of being the source of a lot of that humor, I think that where it lands, it was funny and charming and everything that I would expect it to be from a Sanderson novel. And whenever it didn't, it didn't offend me to the point where I was like, I have to put the book down. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that bad. So yeah, if you have been kind of sitting on this and waiting, maybe like I have to start it with, you know, maybe the Lost Metal coming out or you just had other things to read and maybe you're like me and you read a lot of dense, heavy, fiction, a lot of dense and heavy fantasy and science fiction. I would really encourage you to maybe give this a shot. The stakes are just a little bit lower, at least on the Cosmere level of things, as far as I could tell with the first book and with the self-contained story that's being told inside of it, the stakes are pretty low. That makes it for a really fun read. It makes it for just like a, I don't wanna say buddy cop, cause that's not right, but that kind of is what it is. You know, the snarky relationship that Wax and Wayne have feels, feels very buddy cop. And it's fun. It, I mean, it's just fun. It's a fun and good time. And uh, if you haven't read it yet, you should. It's it's fun. You, you, sh you should read it. It's a good time. You should do that. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> if you made it this far in the video, I, I hope that you'll consider liking and subscribing. Turn on notifications so you can see every time that I post a new video. And uh, drop a comment below and let me know if you have read The Alloy of Law or Any Mistborn or if you're interested in reading it or if you've read it and thought it sucked and, and didn't like it and, and hate all my opinions and that's totally fine too. I don't care. I want to hear about it in the comments. But uh, yeah, I think that that's all I've got. So I'll catch you. Uh, I'll catch you in the next one.